All right, excellent. Um, everyone, welcome to this program. Um, I am Natalie Belanger with the Connecticut Historical Society. Um, we have quite a few people who are going to be introduced to you in the next minute. Um, I just wanted to thank you all for being here. Um, I want to remind everyone that this program is being recorded and I will be we will be putting the video of the program up on our YouTube page. should be up there within a week. Um, I will put the link to the YouTube page in the chat for you as we um, go forward. Um, please, if you have any questions as we go through the program, um, please use the chat function at the beginning to put your questions in there. We will have time for question and answer later, but I will be monitoring the chat. And if any questions come up as our presenters are doing their thing, I will uh, make sure that they get a chance to answer those as we go uh, through the program. So I'm going to turn it over to, um, to York Lowe, who is going to introduce himself. And um, hello, York, go ahead. Okay, thank you very much, Natalie. So uh, my name is York Lowe. I'm a board member of the Chinese Historical Society of New England, also known as Chesney. So, um, and I'm also the chair of a initiative to essentially celebrate 150 years of uh, Chinese students in America. And of course, uh, that is counting essentially, you know, uh, 1872 when the beginning of the Chinese educational mission that brought over the first 120 uh, Chinese students over to America, which we're going to cover uh, today. Uh, some of you, uh, feel free to go to our website. Uh, you know, we certainly have a lot of content there, uh, which are you know, including papers and pictures and, and, and not just simply covering CEM, but also other uh, subsequent uh, periods in, in terms of Chinese students in, in the country. Uh, but I mean, earlier uh, last year, we actually had another uh, fantastic panel that featured uh, three of the CM students. Actually, one of them uh, went to uh, Andover also. And But I'm really glad to, uh, through that, we actually able to connect with uh, Phillips Academy Andover and of course the Connecticut Historical Society who is running an exhibit uh, on this topic. And Phillips and over having a good number of students and also uh, lots of materials. I'll let them discuss further. And uh, and then most importantly, I think uh, we also have a uh, one of the descendants, the great grandson of Sir Chen Tong Liang Cheng, uh, Stephen Liang, today uh, on the panel. Um, so he that, uh, definitely Sir Chen Tong Liang Cheng is one of the important uh, CEM students uh, that we didn't get to cover last time. And this, this event is fantastic. So I'll pass this on. The moderator for today is actually our, our intern, uh, Will C2, who I guess connects us with the other organization because he is an alum of uh, Phillips Academy Andover. So I'll pass it on to Will, who will introduce uh, all the panelists. Will? Hi, everyone, and thanks, York and Natalie. Um, as York said, I'm an alum from Phillips Academy, who is an intern at the Chinese Historical Society of New England. And welcome, everyone, to today's event. So I'm going to go ahead and introduce uh, our three speakers from today. Uh, first, we'll hear from Karen Lee Miller, who is the research historian at the Connecticut Histori Historical Society. And then you'll hear from Dr. Paige Roberts, who is the director of archives and specials collections at Phillips Academy. And then finally, you'll hear from the great, great grandson of Sir Chun Tung Liang Chen, Stephen Liang. All right. Karen, you're muted. After three years of Zoom, <laughs> one would think we would be pros, but no. <laughs> so thank you so much for joining us this evening. I am delighted to introduce you to the CEM exhibit at the Connecticut Historical Society. It will run through June. So we, of course, invite you to come visit in person and uh, learn more about the story. Uh, and tonight, I'm not going to repeat the story of the CEM history, but rather uh, talk about how we shared the history to people who may be unfamiliar with um, the, you know, the sequence of events and the persons involved. Uh, instead, I'm going to focus on how we added depth and how we expanded on stories, how we were able to learn more with more of what we already knew, right? We just want to know, uh, there are so many researchers who have done remarkable work 
and we want to see if we could um, you know, extend that story and get uh, additional layers, make it more nuanced and, and complicated as well. And uh, this exhibit began with our uh, CEO, Robert Kret, who knew that we had a very rich, we have a very rich collection of CEM materials, including original letters, photographs, uh, manuscripts, et cetera. And you know, he thought about sharing them to honor the 150th uh, anniversary of the CEM. So let's see if, okay. Our exhibit is available online in case um, you are not able to come and join us in person or it could supplement and complement your in-person visit. I've included a link below, but if you go to our website, chs.org um, and look under the exhibitions, you can join us virtually and take a walk through the exhibit uh, thanks to technology. So this is a clip uh, just a, an image of what you'll see when you first enter the virtual exhibit. So thanks to technology, uh, we are able to film this exhibit and give you a fairly um, uh, you know, intimate look and experience of this exhibit. And it's, uh, it's, it's fairly simple to use. I always say like, if I can, <laughs> if I know how to maneuver through this exhibit, anybody could do this. So, and if you have any issues or uh, questions about it, also please feel free to ask us. So one of the first technologies I want to talk about are the developments in mapping and GIS. In this part of the exhibit, we mapped the journey of the boys. So the journey of the boys is already fairly uh, well known, right? That we we know that it took you know they took a certain route that they um, stopped in Japan and then did over uh, over the sea, and then took the transcontinental railroad across the nation. And uh, you know we had an approximate uh, guess of how many days it would have taken, etc. But we actually had a volunteer who made us a a incredible map. He uh, is experienced in historical cartography, and that includes research into the archives. And what he did for us was to check uh, birthing records, B-E-R-T-H, like birth uh, related to ships, uh, in archives in Australia. So he mapped the route the ships took, uh, all, all the voyages, and he kind of um, approximated and gave us one route for the graphic for the purposes of this magnetic map. So you can see where people like, you know, quite often we might have guessed like, well, do they go straight across? Why don't they do a straight line? But, you know, I learned that there are things like seasons and winds and how these impact people's journeys. We have uh, like, for example, Young Shang Him talked about his journey across the sea we have um, other people, other boys who wrote about their memories of that uh, ocean voyage and how, you know, that creaking wooden paddle wheel was terrifying to listen to during storms or, um, you know, how they would see pods of whales and that sort of uh, thrilling firsthand narrative is important, but also by using uh, contemporary mapping and GIS uh, tools plus, um, uh, actual, you know, shipping logs and birthing records, we're able to get a really accurate uh, and and more nuanced picture of what this experience was like over certain uh, seasons. And we also have the same for the transcontinental railroad. How many times they got on and off? Uh, you know, each um, uh, railroad. You know, it wasn't a straight trip. <laughs> it must have been very, very difficult to get on and off all those trains with all of your luggage. And it just gives us a more of appreciation of how traveling was very difficult. It was a rare experience for anyone, right, in the 1870s around the, in the world. And these boys took this, right, like uh, uh, over the ocean, over the land, and made this uh, incredible journey. And so technology is helping us understand that journey even uh, in greater detail. Another map that we were able to uh, create 
with the help with the thanks to our volunteer uh, historic cartographer is a map of where the boys lived when they first arrived. So, you know, we understood the boys moved around after uh, they were placed in their initial homes, but this gives us a sense of like how many boys lived in each town, what sorts of towns these were. Uh, let's see, I'm gonna go in a little bit further. And you're like, oh, we already knew that. You know, Professor Edward Rhodes wrote this uh, fantastic book giving us all these town names. But what our cartographer was able to do was trace, like he had all of the railroads that existed in 1872 in Connecticut. So I'm just giving you um, a close up and it gives you another sense of how these boys experience life in New England. So if you see, for example, you know, Hartford um, it has so many train roads going through it. And that helps us uh, realize again, how the boys were able to travel to Hartford for Chinese school and uh, cultural lessons. And then you start looking at places like Washington, Connecticut, where you know there were several boys placed at the gunnery school. And look, there's this one train route and it kind of ends in the middle of nowhere because there isn't a railroad that extends yet, right? It doesn't connect to this one from Winstead. So imagine like how, how the train probably didn't run very often through Washington and then how they would have had to probably come down and connect through several railroads before they were able to get to Chinese school. And, and again, like with further analysis of our, uh, of what we've already known, right? Deeper analysis with new tools, we are able to uh, appreciate more of the boys' experiences. So I want to throw this in because I thought it was an interesting um, uh, bit of information. I will, and I'll talk about our, our remarkable, uh, talented translator in just a moment. But you know, there were words like, how do you say Hartford? 1870s, how do you say Hartford in Chinese? How do you write back home and talk about Hartford or Connecticut? Or what if you lived in Winstead? How do you communicate that? And uh, our translator found these uh, uh, two. So this uh, is on the left and the right. There are two separate uh, translations or actually, um, I guess, uh, more like phonetics in uh, Cantonese. So on the left, it's pronounced like hak fu. I'm sorry, I don't have my intonations correct, <laughs> but it sounds, you know, for a while, our translator's like, what in the world is a hak fu? What in the world? And he's like, Hartford. When you say it out loud, you're like, right? These light bulb moments. And similarly with this, uh, these characters on the right, this symbol right here, which looks like a box, actually is the character for mouth, right? So it means say it, right? Like how you should say it. And again, it sounds like you say heart. Well, I, I, I essentially you say, you say something that sounds like heartford. So um, I just love this because it lends again, a, another sense of how, how do you name things that were unnamed at this point? In our exhibit, we also have uh, materials like the boys' report cards or uh, school reports. This might be astonishing to all of us today, but all of the your every student's class ranking, <laughs> academic ranking, imagine uh, we're we're listed publicly, right? So anyone could access this. Uh, so we get an um, again uh, a sense of where the boys uh, were in their academic studies. I don't think they allow this sort of thing today. <laughs> we at the CHS hold autograph books and uh, it has come to our attention that we actually, in our collection, we hold two um, books that belong to students themselves. And this is incredibly rare. We know of another one in, uh, uh, in the Yale archives. And beyond that, we have not yet heard of uh, autograph and other people's autograph books and other uh, collections. So in the 19th century, uh, women, men, children, everybody of all ages uh, had these autograph books. These are things that you carry with you and treasure and uh, people wrote notes uh, you know, to each other in them. And this doesn't require any sort of new technology, just more of a revelation. Right. That, oh, we have uh, these two um, very special books. So we could see how the boys interacted with their uh, white classmates, right? Uh, you know, what they wrote to them, what other students wrote in their books, et cetera. Um, for example, Young Kwai 
wrote in one of his uh, CEM classmates books, he wrote in Chinese and English. And same with this one. So now I have the pleasure of talking about translations. We have original letters at the CEHS and uh, two of the most well-known collections are um, Harriet Atwell's letters uh, as well as um, letters in other collections, right? They're just, uh, they're not specifically only in one collection. They're because they, the boys lived with various families. They exchanged correspondence with uh, multiple parties. So on the left, for example, here, we have one from Kwong Ki Chu, who is a translator for the CEM. He's writing to Harriet Atwell, who is our student, uh, Chui Ga Yao's, uh, it's his house mother, right? His, his, his mother figure in America. So we have a CEM uh, staff member writing to a local host mother. We also have letters from Chui Ga Yao writing back to Harriet Atwell in 1885, for, in this case, and uh, at this point, he's back in China. So we have letters in English, and we've known that we've had these letters in English, and we've been able to access them. They are available on the CTDA. So if you do an online search for CTDA, which stands for Connecticut Digital Archives, you can also read these letters. Just search for Chinese Educational Mission. But the exciting part <laughs> that was new for our uh, exhibition are these original letters written in Chinese, in classical Chinese. And to our knowledge, they had not been they have not been translated before. Uh, we had a volunteer translator, uh, Dr. Henry Q, who has spent um, uh, many, many hours, months and months working uh, on translating these letters. So we, you know, we're still working on these in uh, progress. So he transcribes them into uh, a Chinese so that people who can read Chinese uh, can access them. And he writes it for, uh, he translated it into English as well so that we are able to um, also uh, further access them. And this is just uh, really exciting. This is uh, Dr. Henry Q. It is really exciting because now we have a fairly well-rounded picture of what life was like for a CEM student. Trey Gaya was a self-supporting student, self-funded, and you know, his tuition's paid for by his family. So he's not uh, listed as one of the CEM boys, but he experiences everything that the CEM students uh, uh, go through. And so now we have this life, right? This life of letters exchanged uh, from, let's see, like a CEM staff member to a host family. And then between Chui Ga Yao and his um, Chinese family, right? And then his uh, friends and classmates here in, in New England. So it's, you know, we get um, this really uh, uh, complicated and wonderful and really intimate picture of what life is like for a boy student at this time. And uh, we thank uh, Dr. Henry Q for all of his work um, in our, our exhibit and online. You can listen to excerpts of some of these letters. They are read by uh, CEM de descendants, boy descendants. We also uh, are incredibly grateful to the for the support of CEM descendants who have uh, you know, shared their stories and talked about the legacy. And this was really important to us to include in this exhibit. Um, I, the technology would be Zoom <laughs> as, as uh, uh, so many of us have come to rely on. So it's fantastic. We were able to talk to you know, Dr. Paul Lin in Hawaii, uh, Bruce Chan in Toronto, Roger Lee in uh, Shanghai and Debbie Jang in Canada as well. So it becomes this international collaboration. And this is you know, how this exhibit came together with a lot of uh, support and contributions and uh, just, you know, so many stories are being told uh, within this exhibition. And it continues. Sorry, I apologize right now for this uh, fairly blurry photo. So in addition to uh, the descendants, we were also uh, fortunate to connect with the descendants of a host family, the Vales of Springfield. Uh, so these descendants came to our opening and they donated a teapot that belonged to Yong Kwai. And they brought this little tin type. And you know, the reason it's blurry is because one, we need, still need to scan it. And the original of this photo is tiny. It's like 
the size of a thumbnail. So we need to scan it and get it as high res as possible and blow it up. And, and uh, maybe we'll put it out to the community and see if we can identify these uh, students. And uh, you know the, the journey continues, the uh, exploration and the continuation of expanding this narratives and our, you know, our connections to the uh, CEM journey uh, is, you know, continues as we uncover and have more tools and collaborate with our communities. Thank you. Well, hello. Um, my name is Paige Roberts. I'm Director of Archives and Special Collections at Phillips Academy. Um, and I'm really excited to talk about uh, the role of Chinese students at Phillips Academy, some of the arc of the history. Um, so let's see if I can get my thing working here. Um, so, um, God, it was that was so fascinating. Thank you, Karen. Really exciting to see the amazing material that you have at CHS. Um, we are fortunate to have some incredible primary sources at Andover as well. Um, so this has been a project a few years in the making. I started working with um, Professor Emma Tung um, at MIT in 2016 and then worked with um, Adrian Jong, class of 2018, um, who's now at Yale. And um, working with them was really super inspiring for me. Um, and so we've been building on that. And I should say that this website has been um, built by, we were very fortunate to, to find Dr. Xiao Li, a historian, um, and she built this website for us. And she is, I believe, maybe in the audience. So um, can hopefully correct me if I make any major errors. <laughs> um, let's see if this is gonna work. Okay. Oh, okay, it's looking a little stuck. Um, Maybe I need to, oh no. Sorry about that, let's see. Um, sorry, my thing is stuck. Okay, maybe I'm gonna try again, okay. Um, let's see if that will work. Ugh. Okay. Hmm. One of those, of course, it worked at home, right? <laughs> Ugh. Okay, come on. Okay. Um, so I just wanted to briefly mention that um, Andover is really three schools. Phillips Academy, um, a boys school uh, founded in 1778. Um, Andover Theological Seminary, founded in 1807 to train young men as Protestant ministers and missionaries around the world. And then 20 years later, um, Abbott Academy, a school for girls um, that was located right next to Phillips. So these are three schools, essentially all on the same campus. Um, and so we've had three waves of Chinese students at Andover. Um, obviously the first that we, um, Karen did such a great job of talking about is the Chinese educational mission. Um, and we mostly had a uh, four years uh, period, which of course kind of ended with the Chinese Exclusion Act in 1882. Um, the students had to go home. We had 11 boys here during the CEM period. Um, and then, um, I will talk a little bit more about the other periods, but um, there was Stearns in during the 19 teens and 20s, and many, many kids came from China during that period. And then um, yet again in 1980, we worked with the State Department to set up an exchange program with the Harbin Institute of Technology um, that set, sent us basically the three top students at Harbin um, every year for about 15 years. So this um, beautiful visualization that Xiao built um, gives a sense of sort of the arc of the um, Chinese students at Andover over the uh, years, past 150 years. 
Um, so these are um, just, I picked a couple out of the 11 um, and there's a lot more on the website. Um, so on the left is Hong Yang Chong, who um, was here in 1879. He became um, the first Chinese lawyer in the United States. Um, he went on to Columbia and then Columbia Law School. Um, so we're really proud of him. And um, also um, uh, Chow, Shaosin Chow, um, ended up becoming a businessman and a diplomat. Um, he lived in Hong Kong and his, I believe it's his great granddaughter um, is actually on campus now as a student at Andover. So that's really amazing. Um, and uh, really the most important and probably interesting person and um, Stephen Leong is gonna talk a little bit more about him is um, Chen Chong Long Chong who was class of 1882. He was um, a really important member of the Phillips Academy baseball team. And he was really proud of his role on the baseball team. And um, so that, that participation was important to him both on a personal level and professionally as a diplomat. He became Chinese ambassador to the United States and working with Teddy Roosevelt set up the Boxer Indemnity Scholarship fund in part, I think he had a, a large level of credibility with Roosevelt because he had he had played on that Andover baseball team and in fact hit a winning run against Exeter um, that was pretty memorable uh, for him. Um, so we have, uh, this is a bit of information about Dong Chung um, from the website. So you can see we have a photograph of him as a student at Andover and then a little bit of biographical information. Um, I'm gonna click on the link. We'll see if this will work. Um, take me to the, um, to show you the uh, page about Nong Chung um, on our website. So there's a quite a bit of biographical information that Xiao Li has built into the site. Um, including a little bit of primary sources. And then we have a link to his scrapbook, um, which we have digitized. So you can see every um, page in here with, it has a lot of clippings. There are some really great photographs. Yeah, there are a lot of clippings um, and a little bit about his family. So, um, okay. Um, and so, as I mentioned, uh, Liang Chung created the Boxer Indemnity Scholarship Program. Um, in addition to that, he was founder of Tsinghua University um, in 1911. And that's, of course, the MIT of China. And so um, he's really one of the most important Andover alumni. And I feel like this project has really brought him renewed attention at the school. Um, in fact, we have a mural that was done of the history of the school in 1930, and he's the only non-white person shown. Um, in fact, he was given a, a, an alumni award of distinction in uh, when he came back to campus in 1908. It shows you the esteem with which he was regarded at such an early point. Um, so the second wave of Chinese students came um, during the 19 teens and 20s. Uh, they actually were not officially part of the boxer program, but uh, the principal of Phillips Academy, Alfred Stearns, had what he called a mania for China, um, was just absolutely fascinated. In fact, he um, did a round the world trip in 1912 and spent a, a bit of time in November, December 1912 um, in China and visiting some Chinese alumni there, including Sung Sun Quan. Um, who was an architect and very important in uh, the history of track and other athletics um, in China. So um, this is just an example of a, you know, one of the, there's just an enormous vol voluminous collection of correspondence, thousands of letters between Stearns and the Chinese students, Stearns and the Chinese parents. Um, just like the collection at the Connecticut Historical Society, the vast majority is in English. Um, so these have been digitized and transcribed, and these are all on our website. 
So here, for instance, is a um, really glowing letter from an alum CCU um, in 1922, where he says, I believe there is no word that can express my feeling and gratitude for your kind and long letter of December 16th, 1921, which has just reached me this morning. The sincerity and considerate attitude with which you wrote it are especially convincing. It has always been my firm belief that you have rendered China great help by educating the young Chinese in your school and giving them advice from time to time when they have come out from it. You've probably given China greater help in this way than through any other means. I am not exaggerating a bit when I tell you frankly that the place where I have drawn most of the inspiration for my life is in Andover, and that it is you who have given me that inspiration. The spirit and courage with which you do things cannot be forgotten. The Andover days are the best part of my life. Really, really extraordinary uh, letter. Um, and the third program was a student exchange that we had with Harbin um, starting in 1980. And um, so that's a really interesting program. I think there's a lot more that we need to do in terms of oral history interviews with um, some of these much more recent alumni. Um, and this is another really kind of cool graphic um, data visualization that Xiao has uh, built into our website showing it's called a relationship network and obviously just kind of shows the connections between some of the uh, correspondence in um, particularly the Stearns era letters. So you can see Long Chung on the bottom writing to Alfred Stearns in the middle. And then um, we have probably the most uh, substantial amount of material is with, with and about the Sun family. Um, there were a four kids who came, um, Arthur, Charlie, Tommy, and Mary. Mary um, was one of two girls that uh, Stearns was guardian for, and Mary ended up um, for a little while at Abbott Academy. So um, that's really exciting for us. Some of the funding for our project came from the Abbott Academy Fund. So um, there's really wonderful correspondence um, with and about Mary. Um, so in uh, another sort of step to our process, just thinking about kind of what Karen was talking about in terms of sharing all of this amazing material, um, I worked with Dr. Hiju Sun and um, a computer scientist on campus to teach a course called Silences and Gaps, the record of um, Chinese students in the Phillips Academy archives. And that was in the fall of 2019 and fall 2020. Um, so we really envision this as a digital humanities course in part. We read some really important material in terms of archives and um, archival silences. Uh, we read about Asian American history. And then we did some um, deep thinking about how to ask good questions of such messy data, right? Um, it's really complicated when the data you have is embedded in this uh, voluminous correspondence. So for instance, um, one student came up with this pretty nice little kind of bar graph showing the expenses uh, of Frank Lynn, who was a student, um, he was in the class of 1923, and then went on to, as many did, to MIT. And so you just get a sense of almost his experience on a day-to-day -day level, you know, the things that he's spending money on, um, you know, whether it's the dorm or going to theater in Boston or buying a winter coat or books um, and how that played out over time. Um, he was quite a spender. <laughs> um, another student, Olivia Lai, did, did this just incredible manual labor of reading hundreds of letters to do a sentiment analysis. Um, and she really looked at sort of tracked emotions like happy, sad, angry, scared in these um, letters between Stearns and the students. And even though the final product, this um, graph that she built looks very simple, um, it's a tremendous amount of work that she did to produce this, looking at the shift of emotions um, in some of these letters over time. 
Um, and then uh, later on after the class, um, sort of as part of our course, uh, Sophie Wang, who's a filmmaker, um, actually produced a film kind of about our class and about the experience of Asian student, students at Andover. Um, so that's really exciting. And the work of all the students in the two classes that we did are all on the website. So, um, you know, the research, uh, the data visualizations that they produced, it's, it's really wonderful. Um, and then uh, building on that work, um, last year, um, I worked really closely with this student, Frank Joe, on um, his major research project, um, really diving deep into Stern's correspondence with the Chinese students. Um, and he put it kind of in the context of muscular Christianity uh, of the sort of late 19th, early 20th century and thinking about um, values of patriotism and discipline, um, you know, really doing, um, I think, a pretty rich analysis of American Protestant rhetoric um, with Stearns at the center, but, you know, really this relationship with these Chinese students. Um, and I'm pleased to say he's now at Harvard continuing this work at the Fairbanks Center. Um, so uh, that's kind of a quick rundown of our project, um, and I'm happy to take any questions um, at the end. Thanks so much. Hey. Well, hello, everybody. Can you guys hear me okay? Okay. Uh, so I'll share my screen. Okay. It's great to hear Paige and uh, your presentation. And thank you, York and Nelly, for hosting this meeting. Uh, so uh, I'm going to present the life of Sir Chen Tang Liang Chang. Uh, if you look at the screen here, the, this is just a cover page, but uh, those are actually his writing. So uh, that would be something that you might want to take a good look at. Okay. Uh, so Liang Cheng had uh, basic, I have two other brothers actually that have uh, diplomatic services as well. This one came from the government of China. Uh, it's not complete because uh, it, in the, uh, in the uh, Chinese genealogy, they don't record any any uh, kids that have died early and they don't record the girls. So it's not complete. But uh, it was amazing that when I phoned the Chinese government uh, back in the year 2010, they have that on record. This one comes from the, um, come from the Liang uh, genealogy. The family had a record going back uh, 20, well, going back to 21 generations now. So uh, basically, Liang was Liang Cheng was born November thirtieth, nineteen eighty four. Okay, as uh, as you can see, had many names, okay, which is customary in the Chinese culture back in those days. And he was uh, he was born in Guangpu Village, okay, Guang uh, Guangzhou. His mother name, last name only, uh, I could not find her name, but said in Mandarin is Chu, uh, but in uh, China in Cantonese. It is what. So Liang Chang came, uh, he was part of the fourth detachment of students, one, the last one out of the four detachments that uh, go to Connecticut. And uh, so 19 October 14, 1987, left Shanghai, China with the, he was in the fourth detachment. If you look at the Lafarge, uh, he was number 118 out of the 120 students. Uh, so he arrived in San Francisco, California. Uh, like uh, Karen was saying, okay, uh, took the train all the way across from the West Coast to East Coast. And in 1987, 80 to 80, 78, sorry, 1975 to 1978, okay, uh, he was in Ham Amherst, Massachusetts. And then he was taught Greek by a teacher from Amherst College. Uh, so my research tells me that he had a real fondness of Amherst. As a matter of fact, later on in life, he actually went back and stayed in uh, Amherst during the summer when he was ambassador to the United States. Uh, then in 1987, uh, 1976 to 1981, okay, the host family was J.M. Harrington. 
1978 to 1981, he was at Phillips Academy. And of course, he was the, the Chinese government recalled the Chinese students. He did not, uh, he was in his last year uh, when he was recalled. So um, here just is just a slide. I think uh, page, page showed you guys the picture of him there uh, from Phillips Academy. And also here are just some of the names, okay? Because of the Romanization, uh, there's many, many different variations of that. 1881 to 1885, he was, he took, uh, that was after he had returned to China when he was recalled, the students were recalled to go back to China. His first assignment was in China, assigned to the Naval School in Tianjin. And then he was later positioned and assigned as a clerk to the, uh, what we, in Mandarin is Zhongli uh, Yaman, which is the, uh, my Mandarin is not very good, by the way. So uh, the, as a student, I purchase. Okay, so ranked second class assistant secretary of the board. So in 1985, he had an honorary graduate, he was an honorary graduate of the class of 1985. In 1983, 1883, he was the second rank interpreter at the Chinese legation in Washington. 1886 was second rank uh, interpreter in the Chinese legation in Washington and a company Chinese minister uh, Zheng Yin Han on a mission to Spain, Peru, etc. 1984, it was in Japan, he served as a third rank, sorry, it was the third rank consultant to Chang's mission to Japan. And then 1897, he accompanied Prince Chan to Great Britain to the, um, that was the 60th Jubilee of the reign of Queen Victoria. It was there that he was knighted, Knight Commander of Michael and St. Michael and St. George, which is KCMG. 1991, he was, uh, he was the ambassador to Berlin, Germany. No, sorry. 1991, he accompanied the prince, okay, as the first secretary to Berlin to apologize for the killing of the German minister during the Boxer Rebellion, okay, which later led to the Boxer Indemnity. It was there that he was, uh, if you read Walter Muir Whitehill's book, he uh, mentioned the, uh, that uh, it was there that the Kaiser wanted the prince to kneel down to apologize to the, to the German and uh, to the Germans. And uh, so Chen Tang Lian said, no, the prince will not okay, uh, kneel down to in front of foreign subjects, but will extend the highest courtesy as a foreign sub, uh, foreigner uh, comes to China. So the prince was spared okay, and did not have to kneel down in front of the Kaiser. From then he was known as a, as a capable diplomat. Here's a picture from my cousin, actually that just came re recently that he, um, and um, it was taken between sometime between November 2000, uh, 1909, okay, and uh, November 20th, 1909, and uh, November 27th, 1909. That's when he uh, accompanied um, the prince, Chai Shen, oh, sorry, to, uh, to, for naval, uh, to tour the naval, naval bases in the UK, okay. And I just have to look this up. And this is Prince Chai Sun, okay, the little on the left there. And the person behind there, okay, with the mustache, that is actually uh, Mr. Yaro. 1902, July, he was appointed ambassador to the United States. At that time, it's not the ambassador, it's the minister. The correct name is Minister Plenipotentiary to the United States of America. And uh, he was, uh, he get the additional duties of um, the minister responsible for Cuba, Peru, and Spain. And then he, and then Mexico was added to that as well. And then he was relieved of the responsibility to Mexico and, and Spain in 1903. As uh, we all know, he played a significant role in negotiating and the negotiation of the Boxer indemnity. Here's the Chinese legation. Uh, if you 
look closely on the top right, uh, the top left hand corner there is Yong Kwan, okay, another CEM student. Right next to him, the shorter person is Chong Man Yu. Okay, Chong Man Yu is another Chargers Affair, also another CEM student, okay, and went to Yale. And um, so, and this is uh, the person in the middle was uh, Sir Chen Kang Lian Cheng. Here is a actually a, a dinner menu that we found on the internet, okay, thanks to my cousin, Lorena. I think she's here today as well. So uh, it took quite a bit of work for us to decipher what that is. Uh, it is written almost, it looks like Chinese, but it's actually the dinner menu. Uh, so we deciphered that and this is the dinner menu here. Okay, dinner to His Excellency Sir Chen Kang Yen Cheng, Envoy Extraordinary and Minister Plenipotentiary to the United States, Spain, Peru, and Cuba, given by the, the Lotus Club, New York on September 28, 1903, okay? So um, this one is a very important piece. Okay? The picture on the left is actually a paper clipping from a newspaper from the New York Times. There in that particular article, he actually described his interaction with President, President Roosevelt. And he talked about the boxing indemnity. Uh, in it, it says if uh, uh, there was a letter that he wrote to uh, the Secretary of State John Gay at that time, he basically asked that if your honorable country would take the lead in returning the excess indemnity payments, wherever the voice of righteousness spread, those countries would rise and follow it. And then that, that of course was followed by the meeting. He went to the White House and there it was, it was President Roosevelt and uh, he talked about the process and basically it didn't really take that long. And President Roosevelt basically agreed He'll put it. Uh, he'll put the proposition through Congress, which, as we all know, it was passed in 1908, and it was a Tong Xiu Yi and a hundred Chinese students that came back in 1908 to actually sign uh, the the declaration. So, um, so uh, yeah, it was just shortly before he returned to China in July of uh, 1907, 1908. Congress passed a bill to return the excess boxing indemnity, and it was, uh, it was not signed by Tong Kong An, it was signed by Tong Xiu Yi. Tong Xiu Yi is T-A-N-G, okay? Accompanied by 100 Chinese students. And there it was created the boxing indemnity. And of course, it was the beginning of Tsinghua University. Uh, and uh, later on, because the, of the communist government, uh, the part of that, it was not, the indemnity was in installments and it did not, when the communist government came in, the money went to Taiwan. And that's why now you have two Tsinghua University, one in, in uh, Beijing and the other one is in Taiwan. Uh, when he returned to China, he received the Empress in audience for three consecutive days. That came from the New York Times. And that's when he was promoted to first, first rank minister in the Qing court. Now, it is very rare to have a Han, a Chinese, uh, to be in the top rank in the Qing court because it was Manchurians at that particular time. Oops, did I miss something there? And here is just the a letter. Okay? Uh, I do not have the cup. I have never seen the cup. I have an idea of where it may be, but I've never seen it. And that, uh, as Paige talked about the 25th reunion of his class, he was presented a cup. And um, it was presented to Sir Chen Kang Liang in, in recognition of his services to and for the United States, as well as his devotion to the love of Andover. So uh, after he left Washington in 1903, 1907, that was the ambassador to the United States. Uh, August 1906, he fundraised for the sufferers of the Great San Francisco earthquake. Um, and then 1907, upon him returning to China, he had three days of audience, like I said, promoted to first rank minister. And 1910 to the 19, about 1911, 1912, that was the fall of the Qing dynasty. He was the ambassador to Germany. And during that time, he actually attended 
or represented China to the first Opium Conference. If you look at the uh, documents, uh, he was a signature to the, to the uh, Opium Conference, just the first one, okay? Uh, because he was in diplomatic service, he received eight medals. The first one was the Order of St. Michael and St. George, like I mentioned earlier. Then he, he got the member, he was a member of the Legion of Honor of France. He got the Order of the Rising Sun, which is the second highest order. Well, the Order of the Rising Sun, but he got the second highest order of, the, of that order. And he got the Order of St. Anne of Russia, Order of the Red Eagle and the Golden Crown of Germany, Order of Franz Joseph of Austria, Order of Leopold of Belgium. And then he went back, when he went back to the UK, to Great Britain, he got the Knight Commander of the Royal Victorian Order, which is the KCDO. So he was knighted twice. He also had two honorary degrees. The first one was in 1903 Amherst and the second one 1906 at Yale. He also contributed to National Geographic magazine in uh, December of 1905. And he wrote about, the China, about China and the United States. And he also, uh, he also found out about the, uh, the Europeans, I believe it was the uh, Swedish. Anyway, uh, the, he also helped to negotiate the uh, repurchase of the Guangzhou Hankou Railway. And uh, he fundraised for relief of the Chinese sufferers in 1906, like I said, okay, and the first Opium Conference. Uh, of course, the fall of the Qing Dynasty was about 1911, 1912. He was recalled, went back to, the, went back to China, um, and he died in 1917. Shortly after he returned to China, um, he was, according to the family legend, uh, he was asked by Yan Shikai to join the revolution. And he didn't feel that he, it was appropriate. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Uh, but in any case, uh, he, contact, he came down with uh, throat cancer, which in his death certificate here, okay, it says carcinoma of the palate. Okay. Interestingly, interestingly enough, the CEM boys were very, very close. As you can see, the person that actually signed his death certificate was Xiao Shen Chao. And of course, Xiao Shen Chao lived till the ripe old age of 88, and Sir Chen Tan Liang left at, 50, at the young age of 52, but he accomplished more than what most of us have done in our lifetime. Okay, so uh, he uh, basically, he was identified as just a friend, okay, uh, but when he went down, what happened was that uh, he was at odds with Yan Shi Kai, and that's why he went down to Hong Kong, the furthest point in China. Uh, there he also wrote um, a letter to Henry Fearing, and basically he said, uh, I'll talk about that a little bit later, uh, and uh, he was buried back in China, actually, in a place called Long Island. It is an island just off the coast of uh, Guangzhou. And uh, in 1970, they were doing an excavation because we, they were de developing the island. They came upon this grave. And what they did was they, uh, from my understanding, they took the tombstone, they exhumed the body, they threw away his bones, they took the, they took the, um, his official gown, because I would assume that he was wearing the official first rank minister gown. Uh, and, um, Usually there would be grave goods that accompany that. Uh, I have no idea where that went. There must be something there, okay, which was a traditional, which was a Chinese tradition to do that at that time. Uh, his gown and the tombstone apparently is in a museum in Guangzhou. Uh, it is, of course, the gown was in, in not, it's in a very poor shape and it cannot be displayed. So it's, it, it's all in the basement. Uh, so, yeah, so what did the, I was going to talk about something, sorry guys. Oh yeah, um, he was asked to join the revolution and he did not want to do that because uh, he was loyal to the Qing government, even though 
Yes, the Qing Dynasty was Manchurians, uh, but he was treated very, very well by the Dowager Qixi, even though you hear about all the atrocities that was happening uh, by the Dowager, that, 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 that the things that the Dowager did, but uh, he was treated very, very well by the Dowager. So, um, and he did not want to join the revolution. That's why he went down to Hong Kong. Um, basically, you don't bite the hand that feeds you. Okay? Um, uh, I just, I was just doing this research for this presentation and it just happened that the line appears in the Bible as well. Uh, basically the purpose of life, what he taught me anyway, personally, and I think it's a lesson that we all learn from his legacy is that the purpose of life is life full of purposes. Okay, uh, we came into the world with nothing, we leave, we leave with nothing. And um, the, the purpose of life is life of full of purposes. It's not about how big a, uh, a house we have, how nice a car we drive, but it's the legacy that we leave behind and the hearts that we've touched. And uh, that to me was the biggest lesson. Thank you. Oh, there's one, one more, guys. Sorry. Uh, I just want to take you guys to Phillips Academy. Does it still look the same, Paige? Okay, thank you. So here's the wall mural. It, it's, uh, my sister took this back in 1912, I know, 2012 when she was there. So this is a mural in the library about the history of the school. The mural was painted in 1930 and um, that uh, shows different people and places um, on the campus. And um, as you can clearly see, it shows Liang Cheng beautifully. Thank you. I have a question, is that display still there too the display with the articles and about the the great baseball game when i was there um i forgot about 20 years ago there was a display case with articles about the baseball game at, at phillips academy yes at the oliver wendell holmes library N no we went through a major renovation in um 2018, 2019. And so that has been pulled apart. Um, we, when I built the website, we did have sort of a temporary display um, to promote the website. And that has recently been taken down. So I'm actively trying to promote the website. <laughs> okay, thank you. So thank you so much. Karen, Paige, and Stephen for sharing your presentations today. Um, and I'm so glad everyone was able to join us tonight. So um, here uh, we're in a question and answering uh, segment of the of the presentation. So if there's any questions, please go ahead. You can type in the chat or you can just open your mic and ask away. Um, if not, I can I can start with something. So something I was wondering was, um, as Dr. Roberts, uh, Dr. Roberts mentioned, um, a lot of the materials that Andover has been used for teaching. So um, for for Karen of uh, the Kinetic Historical Society, um, has how uh, how has like the Kinetic Historical Society been using um, your um, your exhibition for teaching? Yeah, I think this is one of the really um, the most exciting parts of uh, sharing this information is with younger people who are unfamiliar with the story, with the history. Uh, we have had uh, multiple school groups access it. Uh, we have uh, teachers, uh, professional development uh, groups come in as well. Uh, Connecticut has also recently passed an AAPI curriculum uh, reform. 
So this will be an important uh, starting point for many teachers in Connecticut uh, and hopefully outside of Connecticut as well to be able to uh, you know, further access uh, Asian American history through this e exhibit. We have a question. We have a question in the chat from um, Gary. He's wondering um, if could someone um, enlighten us all a little bit uh, more about the boxer indemnity and what that was all about. Give me one second here. I think I may have the answer. For well, the boxer there was a boxer rebellion in which. Uh, it was also known as the Boxer Uprising. Uh, the Boxer Insurrection, basically, it's a, in Chinese, it's called the Yi Wa Tu. Uh, it was an anti foreign, anti colonial, and anti Christian uprising in China between uh, 1899 and 1901, towards the end of the Qing Dynasty. Uh, so, what happened was that there were foreign subjects that were killed um, during that period. And one of the reasons why uh, Sir Chen Tang Lian Cheng went to Germany, accompanying the prince, was to uh, was to apologize to the Kaiser for the uh, murder of the uh, a baron, of a German subject. And the reason why it was called that was because a lot of the members of the boxers. They were actually boxers. They were kung fu experts, martial arts. They practiced martial arts. But then the I just want to add is the uh, of course the indemnity scholarship program, right? When the U.S. government uh, agreed to return that money to China, I guess in the form of basically sponsoring students. That between 1909 to 1929 brought over, you know, uh, uh, th 1,300 students to America to various universities. So that, uh, and, and similar to the CEM program, many of those students kind of, you know, went back to China and contributed in terms of science, engineering, medicine. Uh, many, I think someone mentioned about certainly a lot of them have went to MIT. Uh, and and uh, and of course, Tsinghua University is actually kind of the, the prep school, uh, pre preparing some of these students to uh, when when, it's, when it was founded to uh, to go to college in uh, the U.S. and then subsequently became, you know, the MIT of China. So, uh, Natalie, any other questions? Yes. I was, I was typing into the chat. I'm going to drop in a link. Um, MIT has um, an article on their website about indemnity students who went to MIT. Yeah. Um, but I, you know, I did have a question. Um, so, um, see, I'm just curious, Stephen, for you personally. Um, so how much, how much of the knowledge about your, it's your great grandfather? Mm -hmm. How much of this knowledge were you sort of raised with and how much is it of this sort of came to you through like later research and study about his life? I'm just sort of curious about how he was remembered, um, not just in China publicly, but like through the, the various branches of your family. Well, to be honest, I mean, uh, she, Sir Cheng Tang Liang died in 1917 and my grandfather actually died in Actually, the, the little boy that you saw next to him uh, for the New York Times newspaper, that, that could have been my great grandfather. Uh, he was wearing these uh, riding boots. Uh, he actually died in the, uh, in the um, horse race. He actually fell off a horse in the last race in Hong Kong. Uh, shortly after that, I don't have the exact date, some more time in the 1920s or 1930s. So I never even met my grandfather. So uh, very little is known about that. Uh, I just started doing my research with uh, my uncle, actually uh, Uncle George Liang. He gave me a uh, Sir Walter Muir White Hills book on you know, the portrait of the Chinese diplomat, Sir Cheng Tang Liang Cheng. And I started reading that and I thought, oh, that was pretty interesting. And then from then on, uh, through various sources, and of course, 
through uh, Phillips Academy as well. I was there in uh, 2010, I believe. Okay, went through his scrapbook and did a lot of research on the internet, you know, the New York Times, uh, and a lot of CEM descendants too. I met Bruce Chen, he found me. Uh, with Chung Man Yu's uh, grandson, he found me and we got connected. And uh, his cousin, Sunny, actually went to China and basically ran around, went to, went to Guangdong, went into his uh, Su Chen Tang Liang's old home and took pictures and sent them to me. So there was uh, a lot of people doing the work, it's not just me. And of course, some of this presentation here too came from my cousins and everybody and family members. Thank you. Any other questions on the chat or anyone who wants to uh, raise them, uh, feel free to turn on your camera and, and while we have this esteem uh, panel. Yeah, I, <laughs> so. I like, I have a question. Yeah. Did, did he, did um, my great grandfather, Sir CLC, as we, Stephen mm -hmm. and I call him, did he learn how to play baseball at Phillips or at in Amherst? Um, at Phillips Academy, because he went to Amherst College after going to Andover. Okay. All right. So Phillips, he learned it at Phillips. Then he went to uh, Amherst College. Okay. All right. I, we, I kind of thought that maybe, <clears throat> you know, as boys growing up in Hartford, that he would, that he would learn how to play baseball, but I guess not. Okay. All right. And did he learn by joining a baseball team or how did he learn? Yeah, interesting. I haven't I haven't uh, uh, sort of explored that issue in detail. I need to do that. Um, baseball in the United States was really a big, big deal on the kind of the North Shore of Massachusetts, not far from Andover. Um, and Alfred Stearns was an Andover alum himself and an outstanding baseball player. Um, so, you know, there are all those connections. So it seems very likely that um, he learned at Phillips Academy because, yeah, he didn't learn at Amherst because he played a PA and he went to PA before he went to Amherst. So maybe um, Alfred has something to do with it. Right. I just, yeah. I mean, and the other kids, it was a big, it was a big deal in Massachusetts, you know, at the time. Because you really can't join a baseball team until you learn how to play baseball, right? Right. Karen, Sorry. our exhibit, um, the CM exhibit at CHS has a, a section about the boys and sports. Karen, do you want to mm -hmm. fill, fill us in a little bit about that? Uh, so I, I don't know about like uh, when specific people learn how to play baseball, but I think one of our collections, I think it's Clara Capron's uh, memories. Her father was the principal of Hartford Public High School, and she was a classmate of many of these boys. And she remembers, and I think it's Clara Capron, she remembers boys like she said, Chinese students would just run into the house. No one bothered knocking. They just open up and, you know, they would just gather friends and uh, go play baseball. So I wonder if it was one of those things that if you were in the neighborhood and, and uh, Clara Capron lived fairly close to the CM headquarters as well. So um, yeah, maybe they just got together and learned uh, even at a fairly young age. Yeah, and I should say that as Xiao Li has kindly um, reminded me, uh, Phillips Academy students were required to play two sports. Um, yeah, you know, again, this is part of the muscular Christianity, right? The connections with the YMCA and Springfield and mm -hmm. Harvard, right? You know, athletics was really important part of kind of American masculinity, you know. So maybe he was exposed to baseball at Hartford, playing with neighborhood boys. Right. And he perfected the game at Phillips. Right. It could be. Okay, great. Thank you. But yeah, I mean, in, on that topic is uh, one, uh, I mean, you, I think you briefly mentioned, Paige, you mentioned Springfield College, right? Obviously being the birthplace of basketball. Right. And there were many, uh, there were a good number of students. There's also the story about a lot of those early Chinese students there. 
many of them went back to China and became the uh, the pioneers uh, of of kind of promoting a lot of sports uh, and organizing the Olympic uh, participation. Right. And in fact, one of them is kind of known as the the uh, godfather of the basketball movement and ultimately the one who groomed uh, Yao Ming. So actually, the the ties. <laughs> You know, actually connects all to the to the present day. So I think it's very, very fascinating. Yeah, there is um, there is a story, and I'm going to link in the chat to an article from um, ConnecticutHistory.org hmm. about this. Of a um, there was a a semi pro you know um, baseball team in Hartford composed of hmm. students from the CEM. Um, they were called uh, they preferred the name Celestials, but they were called the Orientals. And I've actually found, you can find them if you look at newspapers from the time, you know, they're recorded playing against these other semi-pro teams in the area. And there is a story that when they were um, headed back to China after the mission had uh, closed of this team arriving in um, San Francisco and being challenged to a game by a local team, sort of thinking that, you know, the local team thinking they would like just, you know, steamroll. Hmm. You know, how do these Chinese guys know about playing baseball and know the Orientals crushed them? Um, so um, I, I just linked to a story there that the, uh, contains a little bit of that history. Um, but they are definitely, um, you know, remembered um, here in Hartford for that. The There's a greater Hartford, the Twilight Baseball League, which is like sort of a hmm. old timey baseball league um, here in, in Hartford actually also uh, commemorates them as well. And what would be the uh, time span, the years? I'm w wondering if um, Sir CLC was part of that. Um, the so the art I just linked to that article, and I I, I cannot. Hmm. That's okay. Yeah, uh -oh. but you'll be able to find it all in there. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. I believe it was based, that game was based on a record by BC1, uh, Wan Bingzhong, who was one of the uh, the CEM student, uh, who also have, there's, a, of course, an Andover connection. He is the, also the grandfather of Oscar Tang, who was very famous on, I guess, a philanthropist, too. Many of you probably know. Uh, and and he, of course, is also the, uh, the uncle of uh, the Song sisters. So the interesting thing is uh, Wan Bingzhong also did the connection to later uh, students is that he was also the uh, the guardian of a good number of uh, Chinese students who came, you know, through the boxing identity program, and it, of course, his own nieces, the Song sisters, uh, when they came to this country. So, I can share my screen. This um, this image that's in that article I linked to um, that shows that local team oh, is, right. is 1878. Mm -hmm. But I, I cannot read the handwriting underneath. It's too small. Do we have any other questions in the chat? I don't see any. And then I heard that I read that he perfect um he uh Sir CLC perfected the curveball at Phillips. Is that correct? He was known for using the curveball. Um, I am not an expert in that. <laughs> so, so yeah, so that um, so I'm just wondering, um, you know, where he picked that up. Okay, all right, great, thank you. Like okay, so I guess I thank you everyone for attending. Yeah, I was going to say it looks like I just wanted to point out in the chat. It looks like we have one more um, a, a descendant of Sir Sale C in the audience. I'm not going to that person can identify themselves if they'd like to, but I'm not going to say their name if they don't want their name said out loud. Um, yeah, you know, thank you. Right. Um, I, I, I just also put one more link in the chat. I know I've put lots of links, but we do have a couple of programs coming up at the Connecticut Historical Society um that will actually they're both virtual programs so you can tune in from wherever um on march 30 28th we are actually gonna have a program by a, a, a federal judge judge cone 
who is um, an expert on the Chinese Exclusion Act. And he's gonna talk about how Connecticut's mm -hmm. two senators at the time actually argued against the Chinese Exclusion Act. And he believes it has to do with their familiarity with the students of the Chinese educational mission in Hartford. And then um, on um, April 12th, and we don't have this on our website yet, but it will be there in a, in a week or so, we're gonna have um, a program with Henry Q, the translator who worked on our um, exhibition and um, brought those those Chinese language letters to life, and um, that'll be an interesting program too. And you can you can register and tune in um, for that as well. And then from the Ch Chinese Historical Society, if you are uh, yourself, uh, you know, someone who came to school here uh, before 1960s, or you have these ancestors like you know Stephen who have, uh, you know, a lot, you have information, pictures, and anything, uh, you know, definitely reach out to us and we would, and it, with your permission, uh, we can definitely, we can share it on our website or we can just keep it in our archives uh, so that we can, for future research that people are interested in this topic. So thank you very much.